All right, guys, so what I would like to do today is go over the second CRQ in this June 2019 region. So let's turn to CRQ set number two, which, like always, is going to have a first question asking you to describe historical circumstances. You guys have want to remind me what that means, historical circumstances? Yeah, what led up to it? Like, what was going on in the world that could have influenced this particular moment? Okay, so what we have here is a question about China's foreign policy, okay? And this is talking about the efforts of Mao Zedong. Do we remember anything about Mao? Communist. Okay, communist leader of China, right? Yeah, we did this stuff last time, right? So five-year plans, great leap forward. Some people joke around and call it like the Great Leap Backwards because of his collectivization policies that led to massive amounts of famine in China, which isn't great. Okay, so what we have here is, so the question is asking about historical circumstances that led to developments in this document. So let's take a look. Economic development has played a role in China's efforts to establish its identity and to maintain its security at different times in its history. Economic development policies have affected China's relationship with foreigners. This excerpt focuses on economic development in China before Mao came to power and during the time that Mao was in power. All right, so Chinese economic and technological systems were backward compared to those of the West. It couldn't hurt to have in the back of our minds what we mean when we say the West. What's, what's the West? Yeah, I, from, like a, from an Asian point of view, we probably would think of the West as like Western Europe, but also the Americas. Okay, so this author is claiming that China was behind the times compared to the West, at least in terms of economics and technology. This sense of vulnerability created the dominating issue of modern Chinese politics, the search for wealth and power. Left unsolved by previous governments, the problem remained to be addressed by the People's Republic when it came to power in 1949. Okay, so after a long period of Chinese civil war, Mao is in power, and this first paragraph basically is saying China has a lot of problems, and now it has to be dealt with by the new government when it takes over in 1949, or when it took over in 1949. To develop without relying on foreign powers, Mao Zedong and his colleagues devised a system modeled on Stalinism. If I say Stalinism, what country am I referring to? Russia. Yeah, Soviet Union, okay? So basically, what the author is implying is that China is going to pursue basically the same policies that Stalin pursued when he was the leader of the Soviet Union. But with a number of unique features, they collectivized the land and organized the peasants into communes. This basically means that peasants are all going to be living together. Do you guys remember what collective farming means? Yeah. You basically grab up all the land that used to be privately owned, and now these are large government-owned land, lands. And then the peasants would live on that land and grow food for society. Okay, so the government gets to determine how much you get paid and how much of that food you actually get to keep, right? And since it's like communism where it, you don't have that incentive to work harder in order to receive a profit, sometimes with these collective farms, they end up being kind of disastrous and leading to massive amounts of famine. The party state extracted capital from agriculture, meaning they made money from farming, used it to build state-owned industry and return the profits to more industrial investment. Fancy way of saying is that they used the profits from farming to invest in industry. This led to rapid industrial growth in the 1950s, although slowed under, uh, later under the impact of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. This is another key term that we should definitely know when it comes to Mao. Do you guys remember anything about the Cultural Revolution? Did you guys learn about that yet? Okay, I would agree with you, right? So in the Cultural Revolution, definitely women in China entering the workplace. Feel free to jot down any of this. And this is when Mao was basically getting a little bit paranoid that people in China were abandoning the basic principles of communism and the communist revolution. So he grabbed a bunch of teenagers brainwashed them basically, indoctrinated them with communist ideology, and then sent them out into the streets to kind of spy on people and make sure that no one was talking smack about their government. Do you guys remember the name of that, or that group of teenagers that he employed? Red, red, something. red something, yes. Rhymes with fard. Red guard. Oh, yeah. Sound familiar, right? Okay. So we'll just add maybe 
Red Guard used to purge China of perceived threats from dissidents. Okay, a dissident is a fancy word for someone who challenges the authority of the government. So one of the things that they tended to do during the Cultural Revolution was go after like intellectuals and teachers, right? Teachers who know contradictory ideas, who might question the status quo, right? And typically what happens is if you round up all the teachers and then the quality of the, of the education goes down, so too does the economy, right? Because now we're sending people out into the workforce that don't really have good skills. So basically what the author is saying here, just to give you some background information, is that the economy did pretty well in the beginning, but once the Cultural Revolution happened and the smartest people are rounded up and purged, it's going to slow down a bit. So in three decades, China made itself self-sufficient in nearly all resources and technologies. We should know this term, good term to know, self-sufficient. Exactly, right? You can take care of your own needs. You don't depend on somebody else. It's very rare in the modern world for, so, for a country to be completely self-sufficient. There's a great deal of interdependence in, in the modern world. However, by the end of Mao's life in 1976, China's economy was stagnant. And they defined that for you. It means not advancing. And technology lagged 20 to 30 years behind world standards. And most Chinese lived in cramped quarters with poor food and clothing, few comforts, and no freedoms. Much of Asia and the world had raced beyond China toward technological and social modernity, meaning modernness. So these questions, right, explain the historical circumstances. If you guys just summarize the main idea of this document and put that as your answer, that's not going to cut it. You've got to provide some backstory that would explain this moment where Mao Zedong is making these policies. So what, if we work backwards, what events had to happen first for Mao to be in this moment where he's making all these changes? Okay, right, so we can go back to British imperialism in China, right? China's carved up into spheres of influence. That, that might contribute to them being behind the times, right? Because they're trying to throw off European influence. Certainly part of the story. What happened before the communists took over? Communist revolution, right? And, and a civil war between communists and non-communists. Okay, so what I would do is use complete sentences, right? So I will simply restate some of the question. I'll say the historical circumstances that led to the developments discussed in the excerpt were, and then we'll work from there, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and write that in right here. The historical circumstances, forgive my chicken scratch handwriting, that led to the developments, I'll just shorten it up, in the excerpt were that we'll go with Saeed's bit first about imperialism. European countries carved China up into spheres of influence, which is a great thing to say, right? But we can't stop at just stating a past event. We should connect a past event to something we have here, right? So something we have here is that the economy in China was lagging, right? It was behind the times. So we just want to explain the connection, right? carved China into spheres of influence, comma, which contributed to China's weakening economy, right? If you guys remember anything about imperialism, imperialism typically benefits the mother country and makes the colony weaker. They wanted to avoid foreign people, which explains the, the desire for self-sufficiency, right? 100%, I would agree with that, right? So we have a bunch of things we could work with. We have this here, uh, what you just said, Saeed, about wanting to avoid foreigners is totally valid. Right? But maybe we can also add something along the lines. I'm, I'm going to move down all the way to the bottom here because I ran out of space. I'll just say another development was the Chinese Civil War, which was won by the communists and led to the rise of Mao Zedong. Forgive how sloppy this all is. Okay? So basically, I'm identifying past events and connecting them to the document, right? Without the Chinese Civil War having been won by the communists, there would be no Mao Zedong. Right? Without British and, and other European imperialism in China, there wouldn't be a weak economy. All right? So if it was the regions and you only did one of these things, that would be totally fine. They're not asking you to describe and connect every historical circumstance. One should totally do the trick. Does that make any sense, hopefully, a little bit? Cool beans. All right. Let's go to document number two in the CRQ set. God, this is such a wordy Regis exam. I hope you guys don't have the same degree of wordiness. 
right? But now we've got a new leader, Deng Xiaoping, and the question is asking about, excuse me, asking about the purpose for delivering the speech. If the question is asking about the purpose of an author, what does that mean, right? It's your reason for doing something, right? So when we see this, it's like, okay, what was this guy's reason for giving this speech, right? We kind of have to infer that based on the stuff that's said here, right? Because we can't, unfortunately can't go back in time and ask this guy why he made the speech. I think he passed in 1995 or 96, somewhere in there, okay? So we have to kind of figure it out for ourselves. So Deng Xiaoping was the most powerful leader in China from December of 78 until he stepped down in 1992. In early 92, he visited and gave talks in some southern Chinese cities. So he's going to give this talk here. And again, this is very, very wordy. Let's see if we can make some sense of this. The reason some people hesitate to carry out the reform and the open policy and dare not break new ground is in essence that they are afraid it would mean introducing too many elements of capitalism and indeed taking the capitalist road. Let's make sure we understand some key terms. How about the word reform? Exactly, right? The buzzword is change, right? So maybe we write that down, reform equals change. Couldn't hurt, nice, okay? The crux of the matter is, meaning the, the point, is whether the road is capitalist or socialist. The chief criterion for making that judgment should be whether it promotes the growth of the productive forces in a socialist society, increases the overall strength of the socialist state, and raises living standards. This is very confusing, but basically what he's saying here, right up to this point, is that we should judge policies by if they actually provide some sort of benefit. If they're capitalist or if they're socialist, what matters more is benefiting Chinese society. Right? If you guys don't remember the capitalism, socialism stuff, capitalism is basically, to oversimplify for now, the basic idea that you can open up your own business to earn a profit, right? and the government does not get too involved in that. In socialism, if it's like really hardcore socialism, the government owns and operates the businesses, right? And the, the goal is to kind of share profits equally and emphasize more cooperation rather than competition. Okay, so China under communism uses some socialist economic policies, at least at this time, especially the government would own and operate a lot of the big businesses, right? So if there was a factory pumping out iPhones, if this was like 40 years ago, the Chinese government would own that factory, not Apple if that makes sense, all right? So as for building special economic zones, I'll get more into that in a second, some people disagree with the idea right from the start, wondering whether it would not mean introducing capitalism. A special economic zone was like a part of China where a business could open up and not have to worry about the government getting involved. So China was like really desperate after Mao Zedong to kind of stimulate the economy and get it going and get people working again because the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution messed things up. So this guy, Deng Xiaoping, is saying, okay, in some parts of China, we're going to allow businesses to do basically whatever they gotta do to make a profit. So Apple, you wanna come to China, open up a factory? Cool, here's a spot of China where you could do that without our involvement. And then the theory would go that maybe cultural diffusion would happen, so maybe Chinese businesses would learn how to man manufacture their own things. Um, you would also be able to employ Chinese workers and also maybe tax those businesses that are now operating in China. The achievements in the construction of Shenzhen have given these people a definite answer. Special economic zones are socialist, not capitalist. In the case of Shenzhen, the publicly owned sector, meaning government controlled, is the mainstay of the economy, while the foreign invested sector accounts for only a quarter. So he's saying even in these special economic zones, still most of the businesses are owned by the government, not by people like McDonald's and Apple. And even in that sector, we benefit from taxes and employment opportunities, just like I told you guys. We should have more of these, of, of three kinds of foreign invested ventures, joint, cooperative, and foreign owned. There is no reason to be afraid of them. So long as we keep level-headed, there is no cause for alarm. We have our advantages. We have the large and medium-sized state-owned enterprises and the rural enterprises. More important, political power is in our hands. Okay, so he's talking about, again, some of the benefits of having these special economic zones, right? Benefiting from taxes and employment opportunities, okay? Some people argue that the more foreign investment flows in and the more ventures of the three kinds are established, 
the more elements of capitalism will be introduced and the more capitalism will expand in China. These people lack basic knowledge. So he's kind of like rejecting his critics, if you will. At the current stage, foreign funded enterprises in China are allowed to make some money in accordance with existing laws and policies. So like if McDonald's opened up in China, McDonald's can make like a profit. But the government levies taxes on those enterprises. To levy means to collect. Workers get wages from them and we learn technology and managerial skills. Kind of alluding to that cultural diffusion stuff. If you go to China today, they have their own cell phone companies making their own smartphones. It's not just Apple making smartphones in China anymore, for, for example. In addition, we can get information from them that will help us open more markets. Therefore, subject to the constraints of China's overall political and economic conditions, foreign funded, excuse me, foreign funded enterprises are useful supplements to the socialist economy, and in the final analysis, they are good for socialism. Man, that is a wordy document. So we kind of have to distill all that into a purpose, right? This guy is getting up in front of these people and saying these things. And what I would encourage you to do is go beyond the purpose is to tell people about businesses in China. We should probably narrow it down a little more specific than that. If these are the things I've underlined here, what do we think, let's work backwards, right? This is our evidence. What do you think this Deng Xiaoping guy was looking to accomplish by giving this speech? Any ideas? It's tough, right? Like if I got up on stage and I told people all the good things that happened in a country under my leadership, what do you think I'm trying to accomplish? Because that's what this guy is doing, right? Just before he stepped down, he's telling people, yo, like these things are working pretty good. We're benefiting. Why might they do that? Like why would a politician ever do that, you think? Okay, right, so maybe the purpose is to ease people's fears about capitalism or to convince people that his policies are gonna be helpful for China. Seems like a good purpose to me. All right, so let's, let's do a full sentence, right? The purpose of Deng Xiaoping's speech was, let's just rephrase the question here. The purpose, of Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping's speech, was to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with Saeed's, it's perfect, was to convince people that his policies were beneficial to China. Now what I would encourage you guys to do, when possible, is offer up some piece of evidence here to back up the claim, some kind of specific example, right? So maybe we take one of the benefits that we underlined and we plug it into our second sentence, right? So I will say here, I like to use the, start, the starter, this could be inferred from a document or supported by the document. So we'll go with that one. We'll go, this could be inferred from the document when it states. This can be inferred from the document when it states. And you have a choice here. You can either quote something directly or paraphrase something. So what's something nice and easy we can use as an example of benefiting? the Chinese people, right? It brings in employment and opportunities and taxes, right? So maybe this sentence here, right? Benefit from taxes and employment opportunities. So maybe when it states that China, quote, benefits from taxes and employment opportunities. Beautiful. That's all it is. That's all there is to it. If you guys do that on the regions, the graders would be very impressed. I'm pretty sure you'd probably get credit if you just wrote policies were beneficial to China, but it couldn't hurt to support your claim with evidence to make sure it's abundantly clear that you understand what's going on here. Not too bad, right? I know it's a really wordy document, but it's not that bad. But it's, it's, it's definitely long, that's for sure. And by this point in the test, you guys are gonna be shot, I'm sure. Cool, so always with CRQs, it comes in sets, right? You get two documents, one question for each, and then the third question will ask you to use both of the documents together. So far, there have been, I don't know, five, six regions exams, something like that, with this new format. And most of the time, this third set is a cause and effect. But every once in a while, you'll get a similarity and difference, or sometimes you'll get a turning point style. I'll make sure before all of our sessions are done, we do all of them. If you guys remember from the, the first set, it was a question about cause and effect for CRQ set number one, right? Basically explaining how the first one led to the second one. I think this is easier. You have to identify how the documents are similar or different and then provide an example that supports your claim, 
right? So if you were to look at document two, right, which is about Deng Xiaoping and his policies versus Mao Zedong and his policies, you could probably make a case for either one, similar or different. But what jumps out to you guys? Are these things similar or different? How come? Okay, right, certainly document one emphasizes more communist policies. Things like collective farming comes to mind. That's a communist policy. Whereas number two, we certainly have more capitalist policies. How do we know that? We've got um, privately owned businesses being mentioned here. We've got special economic zones, which we should remember is the capitalist idea. And we also mention the word capitalism right in the source. Okay, there's the, the phrase foreign funded enterprises in China. That means a business is owned by somebody other than the Chinese government. So let's go with, we'll go with the differences. So the first thing you wanna do with, with one of these is the identify part. State how the documents are similar or different. And we're gonna go with the difference. Okay, so we're gonna say that the documents are different and we'll say how they're different and then we wanna give information from both to kind of show it. Right, so let's start with the identification. We'll say the documents are different because, are different because each discusses different types of economic systems being used in China. If you guys did that on the regions, you would get one point out of two on this. The second thing you have to do is explain using information from both, right? So if I'm making a claim, that each one discusses a different type of economic system, I just gotta show that difference, right? I have to mention how communism is being mentioned in document one and capitalism is being mentioned in document two. I'd like to use the phrase for example to kind of lead me into that. So I'll say for example, comma, in document one, the author discusses communist policies of Mao Zedong, such as collective farming. Okay, so now we've checked off using information from doc one Right, which supports my claim that we're talking about different economic systems. And then we'll say document two focuses, again, forgive my handwriting, on capitalist policies of Deng Xiaoping, such as foreign owned businesses existing in China's special economic zones. And that's all we have to do. Identify how they're similar or different, don't do both. If you guys do both, they're only gonna grade the first one and then you're just wasting your time because they're, they're, you, you're not gonna get graded on both. They're not gonna pick the better one, if that makes any sense. Identify how they're similar or different and then use the documents to show it. That's it, not too bad, right? I think that's easier than cause and effect, personally. I, th I think it's pretty straightforward.